Children and Dogs, the story of the Syrian woman. Insults. I, I like insults. I, I, like, I like clever insults. Do you, do you know what I mean? The, the, the one I, I really remember and, and always makes me smile is, is the anecdotal tale about Winston Churchill, who was once at a party when he is said to have been approached by a Mrs. Elizabeth Braddock, um, who exclaimed, Mr. Churchill, you are drunk. Uh, Churchill is said to have replied, Madam, you are ugly. However, come the morning, I shall be sober and you will still be ugly. <laughs> Priceless, isn't it? <laughs> but we all know, don't we, uh, that insults, which, which are in fun and in jest like that, can all, uh, easily cross a line uh, between playful fun and, and downright hurt and offence. Which is why it's quite surprising, even shocking, that in today's gospel, we should hear Jesus apparently describing the non-Jewish races around him as dogs. In the Middle East, calling someone a dog has always been a gross insult. And yet, when a Syrophoenician woman comes to ask Jesus for healing for her daughter, Jesus' response is, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. <coughs> Jesus appears to be saying that his ministry, his power to heal, his gifts are meant only for the people of Israel, not for anyone else. What a shock. What an insult to the woman in question. It would have been like me saying, I don't know, that only people of my colour and race are permitted to come to this church. What a dreadful, awful thing to even contemplate. What Jesus said was, on the face of it, rather ethnocentric. Bit of a long word there. Ethnocentric means, of course, centred on a very particular ethnic identity. But, before we are too shocked by this, let me remind you that when we read the Bible, we have to be very, very careful, don't we, about jumping to conclusions. It's too easy to take individual quotes from the pages of the Bible and then use them to justify our own position on something. There are three words which I have taught consistently from this pulpit for the last seven years that I am hoping at least some of you will now remember. Three words which we must always apply to when we read the scriptures. What are they? Excellent, excellent. And for those who didn't get it, say it all together. Context, context, context. So first, let's look at the context of this story. Only a few pages earlier, in verse 8 of chapter 3, Mark reports that many people came to hear Jesus from all around the area surrounding Galilee, including the towns of Tyre and Sidon, which were well-known Gentile cities. There's no sign that Jesus tried to send those Gentiles away in fact, he preached God's good news to them as much as to the Jews from Jerusalem and Galilee. This story itself takes place in Tyre, a Gentile city. In chapter 5 of Mark's Gospel, Jesus heals the man called Legion, who was said to have many demons inside of him. The man was also a Gentile, living in a region which kept pigs, as you may recall. And it was into those pigs that Jesus drove the demons and they went off a cliff. Now, if you haven't made the connection yet, uh, let me just point out that Jews don't eat pigs. Yeah, this was clearly in a Gentile area. And then at the end of Mark's gospel, Mark records Jesus saying to his disciples, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation." So, context one, 
is that God, Mark's gospel is telling us that Jesus was an entirely inclusive figure. He clearly wanted everyone to know about God. And that theme is incidentally re repeated through the other gospels. There's a much wider context we can take into account uh, as well. For example, John's Gospel, chapter 4, records Jesus having a conversation with a Samaritan divorcee woman. Now, that was an astounding thing for Jesus to do. Men of Jesus' time, let alone rabbis, would hardly ever have even spoken to a woman in public, let alone a divorced and Samaritan woman. But Jesus breaks all those conventions. So the context of the story as a whole is that Jesus is anything but ethnocentric. Then there's the context of the writer. That's the second of my three contexts, yeah? First look at the story in its context, then look at the context that was around the writer, Mark, when he wrote this down. What was Mark trying to say by writing this story down? Now, we don't know a huge amount about Mark. Much of what we think we know is pretty much in the realm of legend. Uh, but the assumed writer of this gospel is one John Mark. Mark is his surname, if you like. It would be like writing a gospel according to Kenar. Yeah? Legend tells us that he was a disciple of Peter and that his gospel is essentially, therefore, Peter's memories being written down. But we can't be sure. What we do know is that by the time Mark wrote his gospel, perhaps 20 or 30 years after Jesus, the message of the kingdom had already travelled abroad. It had crossed many national boundaries. Peter, by then, was probably in Rome, and, and Paul had been travelling all around the Mediterranean uh, following Jesus' command to send the gospel out into all the world. So the gospel was written, Mark's gospel in particular, and the others as they followed on to be heard and received by people of every nation. We cannot know, but we can infer that Mark's purpose in telling this particular story is to underline the universality of Jesus' message by showing Jesus himself just wrestling with the issue. You see, in the early days of Christianity, and you can read about this in the book of the Acts, there was a great deal of discussion about whether or not this new faith was intended for Jews alone. Jewish Christians wondered, for example, whether uncircumcised Gentiles could enter the kingdom. I, for one, am grateful that it was decided that they could. I think we can infer with good cause that this story, when Mark wrote it down, was Mark's way of saying, you know, even Jesus wrestled with this question. But Jesus' dialogue with a Gentile woman in need served to confirm <laughs> Jesus' basic instinct. It was an instinct already proved by all the preaching that he'd been doing among Gentile cities, that the kingdom of God is for all humanity. If I was in an African church now, I'd expect you all to say, Amen. The kingdom of God is for all humanity. Amen. Amen. Thank you, choir. Excellent. So we've examined the context of the story. We've examined the context of the writer. Now, who's going to be brave and tell me what the third context is? Come on, who can do it? Hmm? No, good try though. The age was one there. Anybody else? No, those are... Context of the one that, well, she's within the story. So, so, so she, we can look at her, certainly. We should understand who she is and where she's from. You're quite right, Sally. Now, the one I'm thinking of is our context. When we read scripture, we're not just looking into the past. We're, we're reading it for today. We're reading it for us. We're reading it to understand what God is saying to us today in our context. Yeah, are you with me? 
The heart of this story, I think, is the universality of the kingdom of God. Although Jesus and his message sprang from the Jewish world, from Jewish roots, and through the lens of Jewish thought, it is a message for the whole world. The benefits of the kingdom are not meant for just a privileged few. God's kingdom of love reaches out to all humanity. This is an insight we do well to remember. Especially, perhaps, when we start to wonder whether the benefits of a Christian country founded on Christian principles should or should not be made available to those desperately seeking help and shelter from other parts of the world. On a local level, it's a message we need to hear when we think about how we use this building or the wider resources of the parish. Is this building only meant for those of us who gather for an hour on a Sunday morning? Or are the resources of the kingdom meant for all? Secondly, on a more interpersonal context, I think this story reminds us to have some patience with each other when we sometimes get things out of balance or use perhaps hasty words at a time when we were still thinking an issue through, like Jesus seems to have been doing with the Syrophoenician woman. It's good to recognize that we're all human, although we all, with Jesus, contain that divine spark. But in our humanity, we can misspeak from time to time. And we all need to be ready to forgive and move on in our relationships with one another. So, in summary, in our context, we have first the idea that the benefits of the kingdom are for all humanity. And secondly, we're reminded to always act with forgiveness and compassion towards each other. These are, I think, the central themes of this story of Jesus and the Syrophoenician woman. You can argue with me. Please do. I love a debate. Not now, though. Later. But these are the conclusions we take from the context of the story, the context of the writer, and our context, too. All three held together in harmony. These, my brothers and sisters, are ideas to live by. These, as Jesus himself showed, are ideas to be prepared to die for. Amen.